All right. Uh, thanks to you guys who have stuck around for the last talk of the day. Now I'm in the unfortunate position of standing between you and happy hour. So uh, I'll try not to keep you over. Actually, I'm pretty sure we'll probably finish up early. So <laughs> you don't need to worry there. Uh, so let's see. For those of you who read my abstract, I said, you know, machine learning is the new hotness in the data space. And that's definitely true. Uh, a couple of years ago, you know, you could say you do big data and feel like you were saying you were on the cutting edge of data technologies. And I'm sure all of you have seen in the last, you know, few years that machine learning is really becoming that new thing where if you're doing big data alone and not doing machine learning, people are sort of less impressed. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to kid myself. The fact that I said machine learning probably is what got my talk uh, selected. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so anyway, uh, what I wanted to walk through today was just a use case of one um, machine learning solution that we built kind of end-to-end -end that is now in production that uh, is backed by Accumulo. And um, the reason that I wanted to do this talk was because really there's a very healthy dialogue in the community around machine learning algorithms themselves. And um, they get very complex and very sophisticated and there's plenty of academic research surrounding them. What's lacking is sort of the piece, the, the last mile, which is putting them into production. Uh, and we're finding often working with clients that it's not so much the algorithms that are the hard part for them, it's really stringing together the data flow and the whole pipeline uh, that people don't have as much experience with and that make putting something into production really a challenge. And there are, you know, companies like Uber who have tons of money to throw at this problem and whole teams of people. You know, Uber has a pipeline building system, I think it's called Michelangelo, um, that allows their data scientists to put their machine learning pipelines into production. And that's great if you have an organization that can build an entire data science um, department. But most companies don't have that. Most companies are looking to get benefit out of machine learning and might have zero data science experience. So it's not really fair to say, you know, the only way that you're going to be able to benefit from this cool technology that's coming out of academia and out of the community is to invest that much time and resources into those pipelines. So I'm really hoping that as a community, we can start to share with each other more practical experiences that we have in actually putting these things into production. Uh, so that the solution that I'm sharing today is certainly not the most sophisticated from an algorithmic standpoint, um, but I wanted to kind of step through the process from start to end of how we got this thing into production. And I'm hoping that we'll start to do more of that as a community and kind of learn practical uh, applications from each other, practical advice. So just to kind of set up, set the stage for what our problem was that we were facing. So we were working with one of our clients. Um, they're a leading global research firm and part of their business is selling these research reports to their customers. So they put a lot of time and energy into publishing these research reports and part of their business is to sell those. And the legacy system that was in place, the salespeople uh, would kind of depend on word of mouth, um, manual uh, know-how, experience, talking to one another to say, well, I have this customer who's read these research reports. You know, what kind of thing do you think they might be interested in from our new publications? And the problem with that is it's very labor intensive uh, and maybe not always the most accurate because you're depending on other salespeople being familiar with uh, new uh, publications. So um, they were looking to take advantage of maybe a recommendation system where a machine could spit out some recommendations for them. Uh, and, but again, this was a client who had zero data science experience. So they're coming to us not only saying, help us build this, but whatever it is has to be pretty simple, um, easy for us to deploy and understand ourselves. Um, and, you know, it can't be something where they're making a huge investment, time or money, because they have to internally sell this as well. So it's something where they needed to get a big win pretty quickly. Um, 
just to kind of convince others within their organization that this whole big data machine learning thing was even useful. So, you know, we couldn't have come to them and proposed some solution that was going to take a couple years and, you know, millions of dollars to build because there was no way they were going to get buy-in for that. So, those are all the kinds of things you have to take into account. It's not just what they need to accomplish. Uh, it's also kind of all those practical things surrounding a business application. How long do they have? How much money do they have? What expertise do they have? So the second thing is figuring out what data they have. They came to us with about 10 different data sets and said, I don't know which one of these are going to be useful. Um, can you kind of figure out with us which ones are going to be good input to this algorithm? So out of the 10, we kind of narrowed it down to four for the initial use case. And this is what we came up with. The first was uh, customer profiles. So everything they know about their customers, um, their names, where they work, et cetera. Uh, and they had those sitting in a relational database. Um, and something else that they had on their customers were these emails that the customers had back and forth with their sales department. And those were actually housed in Salesforce. And the reason we decided that those would be interesting is because they didn't really have any ability to look in the text of those emails to see if there was any um, valuable information in terms of determining what these clients might be interested in. Uh, so, you know, Salesforce, I think, had come to them and suggested some potential things, ways to leverage the data that they had in Salesforce. And they said, OK, that, that's interesting. But we'd really love to combine that with other types of data. Um, and once you start looking at this variety of data, you know, you really start to bring in more of that big data type solution. So these customer emails had lots of juicy tidbits in terms of what uh, these customers were asking about, what kinds of things they were interested in. So we figured we might as well leverage that as well. Uh, we also had historical data on what those users had purchased in the past, which is obviously key to this. Uh, and last but not least, we had the documents themselves. So the actual PDF documents that had been published. And um, the reason that's important is because we decided we wanted to use that content, which I'll get into in a little bit. So again, there's not a huge scale here. There were about a few hundred thousand documents uh, and um, about five million users. So big enough scale that um, doing computations on these things is, would be hard without a distributed system. But you know, when you're looking at actually storing that much data, clearly they had it sitting in relational databases. So we're really talking about ver the, the variety V of big data here. All right, so once we figured out which data sets we wanted to use, we had to figure out what kind of approach we were going to take for this recommendation engine. And for those of you who are familiar with recommendation engines, you know that there's sort of two major approaches. Uh, the first is collaborative filtering, which is basically predicting what users will like based on their similarity to other users. So saying, you know, I'm like John and he likes these kinds of documents, so I must like those kinds of documents. Um, the, and, and there's lots of pros and cons to these different approaches. I've boiled them down to some kind of very simplistic things we can narrow in on because these were the pros and cons that were important to this customer. And uh, the pros of this collaborative filtering, filtering approach, one is you can bootstrap new users. So if a new user comes into the system and you have no idea what their tastes are yet, uh, if you have some way to say, well, you know, maybe they have a similar job title and a similar um, experience as another user, you can kind of guess that they might like documents that that other user liked. Um, so that's nice, but one of the cons is if you have a brand new publication that comes into the system and nobody has read it yet, it's really hard to get a good feel for what users might be interested in it um, because you kind of don't have that history to base it on. Um, so kind of on the other end is this content-based filtering where you use a profile to indicate what type of item a user might be interested in. So you basically look at their historical patterns and say, OK, well, you know, I can tell that they're interested in cyber security topics. Um, so I'm going to recommend those sorts of topics. And the nice thing about that is when new, brand new items come into the system, so a brand new 
uh, paper comes out about cybersecurity, I know exactly which users to recommend that to. So that's great. Um, but you make the other trade-off, which is that if you have brand new users into the system, you don't really have any way to bootstrap what kinds of items they might be interested in because you don't have their history. So um, there are also hybrid approaches, which sort of take advantage of both strategies. And um, that way you get the benefits of both. The trade-off there is added complexity. So um, you're going to make a different decision on which approach you'd want to take for every different client. Uh, for this particular client, we ended up using a content-based filtering approach, at least initially. Um, and the reason for that was because they weren't as worried about uh, being able to make recommendations for new users because they felt like they could kind of default to manual techniques for that. Uh, what they were worried about was the fact that they were publishing new documents pretty much on a daily basis. So they needed to be able to recommend those documents. So that really was the key um, reason for picking the content-based. So you might ask why we didn't go with the hybrid approach to get the best of both worlds. And again, that goes back to their requirement of needing to get something out fast um, to prove the value of this. So we could have built something more complex, but they didn't really have the time to wait. They really needed to prove this approach to um, their internal stakeholders. So, um, and just to kind of give you an order or an idea of the scale there, uh, we ended up building this end to end in four weeks, um, which was a totally tolerable timeline for them. Um, I feel like if we'd have done a hybrid approach, it probably would have been two or three times more. Um, and that just wasn't something that they had the stomach for. So that's why we ended up making this um, approach. And again, the idea here is not really to give you guys um, a long lecture on recommendation engines, but more to give you a feel for how you make these decisions when you're working with a customer. All right, so once we figure out what data we're going to use, um, what approach we're going to use, we like to stitch together a data flow. And pretty much every um, machine learning implementation that we do with customers we put together a diagram like this. And they all look different. And you know, you might kind of scoff at it because it's just a PowerPoint diagram. But uh, for some reason, this really is the hard part for people. Um, they have a very hard time, I think, just because um, there isn't a lot of experience and a lot of, like I said, sort of dialogue that goes on with sharing how these workflows are stitched together. So even putting something like this together is often, you know, more than half the battle. And, um, you know, we always start with the data sources on the left and then um, kind of figure out how we're going to work, its, how the data is going to work its way through the system. So in this case, um, we basically decided that once the data is in the system, uh, we are going to take this, these kind of raw data sets, which are the, the boxes on a uh, second column on the left, and then we've got to transform them somehow. So uh, the pipeline that we set up is bring, bring all of the data in from their raw sources, kind of bring it in-house. And um, all of these rectangles are stored in Accumulo. So we have all the raw data stored in Accumulo. Uh, and then we've got some sort of intermediate steps. And those are everything in that blue box. And we've actually found that it can be quite useful to materialize the things that are in those, uh, inside the blue box. And I can kind of give some reasons for that later on. Uh, but the basic strategy here was to take the users and their views and kind of come up with that profile for the users. So, um, the first thing you do is combine those two together, you know, basically do a join in essence and um, figure out, you know, what users have viewed which documents. And then out of each document on the bottom here, we're extracting the top terms or the keywords. Uh, and so we're doing the same thing with the emails. And once you have the documents that a user has viewed, along with the keywords in each of those documents or the emails, you can build this user profile. And that's step four which is this user is interested in these key terms. Uh, and once you have that, that's really your, kind of your gold nugget. 
um, because then you can base um, recommendations on that. So when you have a new document that comes into the system, you can look at the keywords and know which users that that can be recommended to. Uh, and so what we've actually done at the end is kind of spit out the top, you know, and recommendations with each of the users. And that again is materialized. And then um, that's the, the recommendations are the piece mostly that the end users interact with. So uh, one way that they do that is they actually just connect the results to Salesforce. So their salespeople can go in for any particular user and figure out what the um, recommendations are for that user. And another way to interact with it is users can actually go in on their website and look at their own recommendations. So uh, one is kind of an export feature and another is sort of a query API feature. Uh, so again, these rectangles are all materialized within Accumulo. And I'll get back to this data flow in a bit because that's gonna be important to why Accumulo matters. So in terms of the algorithm, in case people are interested, um, all of the sort of machine learning pieces were built on Apache Spark using uh, MLlib and then some of the uh, linear algebra libraries within that. And um, I think the important thing there is just to know that, again, because, um, because there were a few million users and so many documents, and we're doing a lot of comparisons, so comparing all the documents to each other, comparing all the documents to all the users, um, that ends up being really necessary to use a um, distributed computing environment to calculate those. So uh, in general, that very naive approach works very well. Uh, that's what they've already put into production, and we didn't have to use anything besides what's already built into Spark's machine learning libraries. And uh, you know, I'm sure that there are many cases where people need to be doing really fancy deep learning, et cetera, where you'd want to use something more sophisticated. But I think the point I wanted to make here was that there's a lot you can do with out-of-the-box libraries that are gonna be really successful for um, a lot of businesses that really don't have the ability to, um, to have exposure to some of this machine learning uh, ideas. And so I guess that's something I wanna advertise is just that Oftentimes, there's, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there, I guess is the point, which is that you can um, help them stitch together these workflows and use some out-of-the-box libraries to really make something very successful. And uh, the fact that we were able to use just Spark and Accumulo, um, you know, and, and the features that Coverse has built on top of Accumulo, that's what allowed us to execute this in four weeks and get something out the door for them. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's the thing that I'm always trying to communicate when I talk to people is that um, there's, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there and we can do a lot for companies that is very successful just based on um, using, using Accumulo, using Spark, and using uh, our, our kind of knowledge that we all have as people in the data science community and data engineering community to stitch together these workflows. So um, of course there's always ways you can improve it. I think it's always nice to get something out the door and then uh, find ways that you can make it better. So you know, in this case, there are probably ideas that you all have as well, but you know, ways that I would improve this would be um, to address that issue of cold start for new users. So when new users are introduced to the system that we have a better way to recommend um, items to them. Um, you know, maybe more efficient methods for finding similar documents. I think I mentioned before that, you know, we're kind of comparing every document to every other document to find similar documents, um, and then every user to, you know, every document to see if they'll be interested in that one or not. Um, so, you know, there are definitely more efficient ways of doing that if you want to do locality sensitive hashing or something. I'm sure there are fancy things you could do to make it scale a little better. Um, and then, you know, something that might not pop out right away is you want to be able to accommodate users with multiple tastes. So this would have a really hard time finding good recommendations if I'm interested in cybersecurity and gardening. Um, because it would look for papers that were on cybersecurity and gardening. 
um, which there are probably not going to be very many of. Um, so this is kind of assuming that users have a very uh, you, you know, unilateral taste. Um, so we could probably do something a little bit more complicated to accommodate users who, who have a variety of tastes. And I'm sure there are other improvements as well. Um, but the idea is usually something very simple uh, can go a long way for people. Um, and then you can do something a little bit more complicated to make it even better. All right, so why did we use Accumulo? That's the point of um, this conference and the point that I wanted to get across today because there, were, there are definitely very specific reasons why we were able to be successful and why Accumulo contributed to those. So going back to our data flow that we had, um, the first thing I would say is Accumulo's ability to store multiple schemas. So um, all of these rectangular data sets, like I said, are stored in Accumulo physically. Um, they're stored, Coverse has these containers called data sets, um, which hold these record objects. And these are just you know, tables in Accumulo. And uh, the nice thing about that is that a record doesn't have to have some predefined schema. It's just this generic object that we can manipulate in our algorithms. So, you know, I had these four different, totally different types of data, but I can store them all in the same table because of the fact that Accumulo can store, you know, schema-free sort of sparse data. Uh, and that was really convenient for us to get this off the ground quickly because we could just get them all into the same table and our analytics could deal with all of these record objects in a very generic fashion uh, rather than having to kind of re-engineer a table and an ingest strategy for each one of those four data sets. Uh, the next benefit, and this is a big one I think for a lot of applications, is just the simplicity of having your analytic output and your input hosted in the same place. So um, I don't. You might see those dotted lines at the end where there's different um, different use cases where these users are querying different parts of this workflow. Um, not only the end results, but some of these intermediate results as well. Um, and that's one reason for materializing those intermediate results is that in the end, they actually did want to query some of those. So for example, um, the users with the top terms, uh, they wanted to be able to actually look at their users and get, and get at those user profiles. Uh, and then the same thing with the documents, being able to look for the documents and seeing what their sort of keywords were. Um, so, you know, the fact that we have all these data sets that we could just be input to our Spark transforms, um, our Spark jobs, uh, and then spit them out into Accumulo in the same sort of, you know, physical table space, um, just allows for much more simplicity in your workflow. Uh, and I don't know of a lot of other, um, or really any other uh, data store that would allow you to do that. Um, where you are kind of reading in your data and able to host online applications out of that same database by writing it back. So, um, like I said, fewer moving parts, which is always good. I'm sure there are potentially ways that we could have read data off of disk faster if we were just reading out of HDFS, um, but the point is that um, you know, speed wasn't as important here. Uh, it was much more, again, about the simplicity of getting something out the door quickly. And again, since these aren't people who have prior experience with um, big data technologies, having to administer less pieces is a much better choice for them as well. And of course, there's one security boundary. So that kind of gets into the next piece, um, actually the last piece, So, which is security. Um, and, you know, that's, we've touched on this several times today. I know uh, people have talked about Accumulo security a bit. In this particular use case, um, we wanted to protect the data in sort of different ways um, for, for the different use cases. But the point is that there's sort of one security boundary that we can make sure that all of our data is protected within. So we had some data set level security that we had to put in place. Um, for example, the documents, I mean, this is the bread and butter of that company. So we wanna make sure that those are protected. Uh, and not everyone in the company should have access to those documents because you could conceivably kind of go sell those on your own. 
Um, so those, those are sensitive. Um, the user data is always sensitive because there's personal information in there. Um, but then even on the sort of more granular level, users who are accessing their recommendations from the website should only have access to their own recommendations. So we've got sort of this high level data set level protections um, plus the sort of row level user um, protections in place. And not having, not having to think about that was very nice, knowing that just by storing this data in Accumulo um, all in one place, all of the data sets, both the original, the intermediate, and the results would be protected. It's um, just nice to not have to think about that as a separate piece to each one, each step of this workflow. So back to the previous um, example. Um, and, and this kind of goes to serving the uh, results from the same data store where you're getting your input. Um, Secondary indexes were highly leveraged to support flexible search. Um, so the fact that Accumulo supports the secondary indexing means that we could allow uh, users to perform some of these searches that I listed on the right. So, um, you know, users want to search for their own recommendations. Uh, that's more of a primary indexing use case where they're kind of looking by their user ID and getting their recommendations. Uh, but the uh, a little bit more on the secondary indexing side, salespeople want to search for users um, with top terms for targeted ad campaigns. So, you know, maybe they have a whole slew of articles that have just come out on a new topic, like NoSQL databases, um, and they'd want to be able to go in and see which users are interested in NoSQL databases and be able to target that ad campaign. Uh, and then same thing, you know, salespeople might want to search the raw documents. Um, and they are doing this. Now that they have to do sort of the recommendations for new users, they're still sort of doing that their old way. Um, they have an improved capability now because they can look at um, the key terms or even search the full text of all those documents. So rather than having to know by word of mouth what are some good cybersecurity articles, they can actually go in and search for some of the key terms that are involved with cybersecurity. Uh, and find where those occur in the documents and find documents for which those were actually the keywords. So the fact that Accumulus supports that secondary indexing allows those searches to happen. All right, so I do wanna thank Jared Winnick, who's my colleague. Um, he collaborated with me on this project when we were implementing it and he also helped out with the slides a bit. So with that, I will open it to questions. Yep, yeah, it's on premise, um, and that again goes back to the fact that they do feel their data is sensitive, didn't, didn't want to host in the cloud somewhere, which is pretty common. You know, I've, we were finding it's about half and half ish. <laughs> um, and obviously, with the government sector, which um, a lot of you are familiar with, um, that's on prem. So it's hosted um, on prem, they have, um, they're using Cloudera and um, Coverse on top of Cloudera on prem. It's good. Um, it takes a little bit of tuning up front sometimes um, because yeah, I think Aaron touched on this a bit. Um, the kind of uh, the package deliveries of Accumulo aren't always tuned very well. Um, so we tend to work with customers on tuning up front. But once that's done, it kind of just does its thing. And yeah, it's pretty good. Yes, yeah, so the question was if we used ALS or a cosine similarity kind of all to all. So alternately yeah, alternately squares, which is sort of, a, it, that's a method of collaborative filtering. Um, we chose to go with just more the brute force um, content-based recommendation. Yep. Yep, yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that. It was on the slide, um, but in order to extract the keywords from the documents, we used TFIDF. Uh, which I'm sure, you know, for those of you who do any NLP, that's a pretty common technique. All right, thanks everyone.